Dr. Paul Nurse. I'm a geneticist. I study how chromosomes are inherited in dividing cells, but my story tonight will be more to do with my own genetics. You probably gathered I'm English. <laughs> I was brought up in the 50s and 60s in London. Um, my family wasn't very rich. I had two brothers. I had a sister. Uh, my dad was a blue-collar worker. My mum was a cleaner. Um, my siblings all left school at 15. And um, I was a little bit different. I sort of did quite well at school. I passed exams, and then I somehow got into university, got a scholarship, and um, then did a PhD. But I wondered, why am I different to the rest of my family? Why did they all leave school at 15, which is, in fact, what happened? Well, I didn't really have much of an answer, but I felt a bit unsettled about that. You know, I wondered about it occasionally, but I carried on with my life. I got a job in a university, I got married, I had two children, Emily and Sarah, and, you know, just got on with things. Then um, my parents, um, who uh, had been living in London, um, they uh, retired to the country. And um, we used to visit them regularly, but the truth was it was a bit boring. You know, they lived in the middle of nowhere, nothing much happened there. And um, my kids, who were perhaps 9 or 10 or 11, got a bit bored when they went there. And Sarah, my 11-year-old, had a project at school. And the project was family trees. I have to tell you, family trees are very bad projects to have at school. <laughs> and um, I said, I got a great idea. You know, I know you get a bit bored at grandma's. Why don't you talk to grandma about her family tree? So we get there, you know, we have dinner, and then off Sarah trots, takes Grandma next door to talk about her family tree. Five minutes later, in comes my mum, absolutely white, absolutely white. And she comes over to me and she said, Sarah's been asking me about my family tree, and I have to tell you something that I've never told you. I was in my 30s by this time. I was in my 30s. She said, I never told you, but what my mum said is she said, Actually, uh, I'm illegitimate. This is what my mum said. She, you know, I'm illegitimate. She'd been born in 1910. Her mum wasn't married. Um, she'd been born in the poor house. She wasn't, poor, she wasn't very um, uh, from a wealthy family. And she was brought up by her grandmother. And her mother had married somebody else who I thought was my grandfather, but that wasn't the case. My grandfather was unknown, so I'd lost a grandfather. Then she turned to me and said, and actually, it's the same for your father, too. <laughs> so in two sentences, I'd lost two grandfathers. Well, this was a bit of a shock. And then I, 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 you know, I began to think about it, and I thought, well, maybe this is where I, I got some exotic genes from somewhere, and they sort of recombined, and, and that's why I'm a bit different. And then I, I remembered uh, that my middle name was Maxime, and I got it from my, my dad, who was called Maxime William John. And, you know, he was a sort of farm worker in the country. That's where he came from, in Norfolk. And I tell you, in Norfolk, farm workers are not called Maxime, usually. <laughs> this is a French-Russian aristocratic sort of name. And um, it did seem a little odd, so I began to sort of imagine that perhaps, um, you know, I had an exotic grandfather's, you know, French-Russian aristocrat and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And that was um, why, I wa why I ended up how I was. And so that seemed all okay. That seemed a reasonable explanation. And, um, and, you know, I forgot about things. And I got on with my career. And I became an Oxford professor, then a departmental chair. Then they knighted me. And then I got a Nobel Prize a few years ago. <laughs> So that's all hunky dory, and then in um, <laughs> in in uh, two thousand in two thousand and three, um, I uh, decided to uh, to come to New York City. Both my parents had died; they lived to the eighties and nineties, and uh, so I came with my family to New York City uh, to be president of Rockefeller University in Upper East Side. And a couple of years ago, two thousand seven. Um, I thought I should try and get a green card. Have you ever seen those poor <laughs> bastards all there queuing up in when you come into immigration? They're all people like me who have to wait there for an hour and a half and have their fingerprints all done. Anyway, and so if you have a green card, residence card, you avoid that. Okay, so I applied for a green card. Huge amount of paperwork. You've no idea how complicated it is. Sent the thing off. 
um, uh, waited a number of months, came back, and I was rejected. <laughs> and I thought, how come I'm rejected? I'm a knight, I've got a Nobel Prize, and I'm president of <laughs> Rockefeller University, and they reject me for a green card. I know Homeland Security has high standards, but I mean, <laughs> this did seem more than a little ridiculous. So I looked through all the paperwork and I eventually found out they did not like the documentation that I'd sent with my application. So I went through it and I picked out, they particularly didn't like my birth certificate. So I got my birth certificate out. And it was a, a so-called short birth certificate, which we have in Britain, which names who you are, where you were born, the time you were born, your citizenship and so on. It doesn't happen to quite name your parents, okay? It's a perfectly <laughs> official document, but um, that's what I had. And um, so uh, I thought, well, I can go and get the long certificate. I knew the registry office would have it, so I phoned up London, the registry office, and said, please send that in the post. I told my secretary in my office, when it arrives, bundle it all up again, send it off to those silly jerks in Homeland Security. <laughs> I went on holiday for a couple of weeks, went to New Zealand, came back um, undoing um, all uh, the mail, looking at my emails and so on. Um, several people in my room, I had um, my uh, secretary, her assistant, my wife who came in, my lab manager was around, so there were quite a few people around. And then I remembered that I told my secretary to, um, to get the, uh, this package sent off, so I asked her, did you manage to do that? And she uh, turned to me and she said, well, I, I didn't do it, she said, because um, the, the certificate arrived, I, I looked at it and I thought, um, maybe you got the name of your mother wrong. I said, of course I didn't get the name of my mother wrong. That would be absolutely ridiculous. So she handed me the, the certificate, and everybody sort of started to look at me. You know, it's a bit of a strange conversation to have. So I open it, I look at it, and there, you know, the name Nurse is my, you know, my, my mother. And I say, well, you know, not a problem there. And then I look at it again, and the name was Miriam Nurse. And that was the name of my sister. It was not the name of my mother at all. It was the name of my sister. So I'm looking at this thinking, oh my God, the registry office have cocked up again, you know? <laughs> and then I look a bit further, and where it says father, there's just a line. Just a dash, no father. And then my wife comes up and says, you know what this might mean, Paul? <laughs> and I was a bit slow, actually, and... Um, <laughs> I really didn't quite realise what it might, might have meant. And then slowly, you know, the, the clouds, you know, roll away. Um, my sister was 18 years and one month older than me, OK? Now, I haven't told you, but um, both, not only my, both my parents had died, who are actually now my grandparents, but also my mother. She died early of multiple sclerosis three or four years before. So I had nobody, and all that generation had died. I had nobody to confirm um, if this story was true. However, on the birth certificate was the place where I was born, and it was my great aunt's house, about 100 miles from London, in a city called Norwich. And um, my great aunt had a daughter who was 11 years of age when I was born. So I phoned her up and said, do you know anything about this? And she said, yes, I do. She said, your sister became pregnant at 17 and she was sent to her aunt's in Norwich, 100 miles away from home. This is like a Dickensian novel, as you can see. <laughs> and um, she gave birth to you and her mother, my grandmother, came up and pretended that the baby was hers. And she sent your real mother back home and several months later she took you back with uh, pretending that um, she was your mother. And we all lived together in this two-bedroom apartment for two and a half years. And then my real mother got married um, and, and left home. And there's a photograph of me um, in this wedding. Um, my mother, my real mother, is holding the hand of her husband in one hand and my hand in the other. Because you realize this was her leaving me with her parents. She never told her husband so the whole thing was kept secret for over half a century. Now, at the same wedding, I crawled under the table, a gate leg table, which had the uh, wedding cake. And I managed to move the leg, and the wedding cake fell off the table <laughs> and smashed into pieces. I wonder whether I was 
revolting at the thought of my mother being taken away. Now, this was a tragedy, I'm sure, for my mother. I was brought up happily, a little dully maybe, by my grandparents, but this was, I'm sure, a tragedy for my mother. She had three children, and she kept four photographs of babies by her bed. I only learnt this after her death. Three were her legitimate children, and I was her fourth illegitimate child. Well, what's the final irony here, really, is I'm not a bad geneticist, <laughs> and my rather simple family kept my own genetic secret for over half a century. Thank you. Paul Nurse.